Welcome to Gethsemane Baptist Temple, the voice of Calvary. Located in Star, South Carolina, we are a lively, old-time, Bible-believing, camp-meeting-style church where the shout has not died out. Join us now as our pastor, Sam Duncan, brings this week's message.
you'd give me a tiny bump there, fellas, I, I would appreciate it. And if you'd stand today, Psalm number 85, uh, as we'll read uh, several verses there in this important psalm, uh, Psalm number 85, right out the gate before you even find your place, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm preaching uh, about a national uh, revival. I believe the hope for the family, the hope for the church, uh, the hope for the nation, uh, and yes, the hope for the world uh, lies, uh, uh, hear me out, old time, spirit filled, Holy Ghost brought revival. That's our only hope. And I believe God's given us a golden uh, opportunity now. Some of the so-called governmental restrictions and some of the persecution to being backed away. Somebody give me an amen. Somebody said, why has God blessed America? Let me tell you, I believe God's blessed America so that America can bless Israel. And amen. Psalm 85, verse 1 Here's what the Bible says, uh, Psalm 85, 1, Lord, uh, thou hast been favorable uh, unto thy land. Uh, thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. 
Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Let me stop right there. I'm glad it didn't say he covered some of their sin, part of their sin, most of their sin. But hallelujah, he said he's covered all their sin. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Oh, but listen to verse 4. Turn us. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? And here's the big question. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you today for the privilege of, of being in the house of God. I do ask, Father, that you might help me to preach this morning with power, uh, with the anointing of God. I just pray that, God, uh, you might help us, God, to be able to see that when you show favor and blessing uh, upon any people, you don't do it just to waste blessing or to waste time. But, God, you do it for a reason. Uh, and I believe that reason is that uh, you've given us another golden opportunity for national uh, revival. Uh, I'm just asking God that you'd send the Holy Ghost uh, all across this land uh, and to touch hearts uh, and God bring conviction uh, and as many, many people fasted uh, and prayed uh, this week. Uh, I pray God they'd continue to fast uh, and continue to pray that the Spirit of God have free reign uh, in this country. Speak to us God, and I pray that the ultimate result would bring revival uh, to this land of ours. Uh, God, I believe you've given us a better opportunity than we've had in a long time. Uh, and I pray that this nation uh, and the churches uh, would not blow uh, that opportunity. We pray it. We ask it, my mighty Father, in Jesus, uh, in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, and all God's people chase the devil out of town uh, by saying what? Uh, Amen. Uh, and amen. Let me begin this morning by saying the psalmist opened up this mighty psalm, Psalm number 85, and he said this statement. Uh, he began to brag uh, on how good that God uh, had been to his land. Uh, he said, Lord, uh, thou hast been favorable uh, unto thy land. Uh, this preacher wants to open up with the same statement. God uh, has been good. God is good all the time, but this past week, I believe God showed some favor and answered prayer as all across America, most Christians finally, are you listening to me, finally took a stand and began to fast and began to pray, and God showed that he's still God. He's almighty. I am so glad. Uh, whoa, uh, I am so glad uh, that this wicked, uh, ungodly agenda of the left-wing radicals was rejected in this country. Somebody, whoa, somebody say so. Hey, America is set up now. I know God, the, the God, right, revival does not come from the government. But boy, we've been in a day where we've been hindered. Now, I didn't let it bother me too much. But some preachers were afraid. Because they said, if you preach something that's politically incorrect, you'll get in trouble. Well, somebody say, what would you rather be, biblically correct or politically correct? 
I might call, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to call a he a he. I'm going to call a she a she. I don't care what they say. I don't care what you identify as. You're what God made you. Somebody say amen. And listen, here in America, I believe without as many restrictions and without all this left-wing propaganda, I believe God has given us an opportunity. Uh, God has shown us that against whatever odds it might be up when God's people unite together uh, and fast uh, and pray, uh, I'm glad Almighty God uh, is still able to deliver the goods. And I believe God can still send revival. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto the land. If you're in agreement today that God's been good, give me an amen. But then right after that, hear me, church, right after that, he said, turn us now, O God. He said, God, you've done your part. And now we got to do our part. Hear me out, church. Don't quit fasting. Don't quit praying. I believe now the mission still is not complete until we see that almighty God uh, takes over in this land. And listen, I hope we've seen the last little murdered baby. I hope we've seen the last crazy, ungodly mess in this land. And let me tell you, church, are you listening? Are you hearing me? excuses for not having revival, it's gone now, buddy. What do you mean? I want you to hear me. As of right now, the Supreme Court has a majority of conservatives that's already been put to the test and they voted in favor of religious freedom multiple times. Not only that, they voted against abortion, killing little innocent babies. Somebody say amen. Oh, listen, you can't blame the government anymore. If we don't have revival, it's on you. It's on you. It's on you. It's on us. But you can't blame the Supreme Court. Soon you won't be able to blame, blame the senators, won't be able to blame the House of Representatives, and come January, you won't be able to blame the president either. Somebody say amen. I believe God has said, all right, I'm going to hold you to the fire. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. You've been talking about revival. You've been against these ungodly principles. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put yourself where your mouth is. And if America does not have revival, there's absolutely no hope. It's done after this. I hope that all across America, that there'll be some preachers get in some pulpits and begin to tell it like it is. You know, hey, don't use this excuse. That I'm afraid that if I go to jail, I won't be any good. I'll be more good on the outside than I am on the inside. The Apostle Paul didn't think that. He went to jail for what he believed, and he won the jailer to the Lord and had a captive audience and won a bunch of the prisoners to God. Somebody say, you don't have the excuse anymore that I'm afraid that I'll be locked up for my faith. Somebody told them, quit making excuses. Church, it's revival time. Oh, hallelujah. God, I think, has given us a golden opportunity. But if we blow it now, I'm sure the devil's trying to tell God that we were nothing but talk anyway. And truth be known, a lot of them were just all talk. I'm telling you what, all across America, there were people that began to uplift God. And people began to pray. I mean, uh, churches are, are not like ours, but still Bible-believing churches. Some of them stiff and starchy. Some of them formal. Some of them like us. But, man, they begin to hold of, get a hold of God and begin to pray. And I believe that, without a doubt, God has blessed America so that America can bless Israel. And I want you to hear me. Any naysayer hear me. God is 
always been concerned with national revival. Look at Israel. It mattered who the leaders were. Look what happened under Saul. Then look what happened under David. It does matter at time after time after time. If they had a bad king, bad things happened. They had a king that upheld the biblical principles and the blessing of God flowed down upon the nation of Israel. Having said all that, I want to give you three simple points. Number one, because not if some people hadn't been living long enough to even know what this first point is. Number one, what is revival? There's not been a national revival since the 1950s. If you, weren't, if you were born in the 60s and beyond, you've never seen national revival. We want to look at, first of all, number one, what is revival? Number two, why we need revival. And number three, who needs revival? Number one, what is revival? I'm going to blow that theory out of the water. Revival is not what the average person thinks. The average person says, well, you have a series of services night after night after night. Let me tell you something. You can meet for five nights, 50 nights, or 500 nights. That does not mean that you've had a revival. We like to call it that, but that's not what it is. Revival starts inside every individual heart. It's not done in a group setting. I go preach the services and call revival sometime. I've had people come in here and preach what we call revival sometime, and we might enjoy it while it's going on, but when the services are over, every go, everybody goes back to living life just like they were before the services start. That's not revival. That might be a good service or a lively service, but let me tell you, true revival is something that America has not seen in 50 or 60 years. It might be a little flicker here and a little flicker there, but I'm talking about a national revival. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? Man, old Saul was nasty, but when he was out of office and David came up, David made a speech. They didn't have nationwide TV then, but same thing. He said, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. See, the horses were their attack, uh, the things they used to go, and the chariots were their defensive. that hide down behind those three walls. He said, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Can I tell you, Trusting in fighter jets and bomb shelters is one thing. But let me tell you what America needs. America needs a good old-fashioned dose of hellfire and Holy Ghost preaching across this land and take advantage of the opportunity that God has given us. I'm looking for the day when it won't be popular to have an abortion. I'm looking for a day when it won't be so popular for two men to want to marry one another. I'm looking for the day that it won't be popular for two women want to marry one another. Somebody give me an amen. I'm looking for the day when it won't be popular for the government funds to pay for a prisoner's sex change operation. Woo! You said, Preacher Sam, I don't like that kind of talk. Proves whose side you're on. Amen. Simply put, that's nasty as hell itself. And it's time that every blood bought child of God take their stand. I preached the other night on having done all to stand. And listen, God doesn't answer prayer for no reason. If God answers prayer, there's always a reason. If you had been sick, had some dreaded disease, and you prayed for God to heal you, and God healed you, he didn't heal you for you to go out to the hell holes and the honky-tonks. 
He healed you to glorify him. If you were rock bottom financially and had no job and you prayed for God to give you a job and he gave you one, he didn't, he didn't give you that job for you to go embezzle from that company. There's a reason. So I don't think God answered prayer in America for us to go back to the status quo. Just float along. Oh, no. Well, you say, Brother Sam, you're talking about revival. You told us what it's not. It's not a series of meetings. Uh, let me tell you, revival is an individual. You can't pre-program it and say, all right, all of us are going to have revival at one time. No, revival comes to the individual. Let me tell you what revival is. If you had the word revival, R-E is a prefix means to do something again. The word vi revival, the last syllable means to be vibrant. Revival means to be vibrant again. Lord, we need to take it back like it was. Years back when folks weren't so proud and heady and high-minded. They didn't mind clapping their hands and lifting their hands. They didn't mind saying amen in a public set. They weren't ashamed to be seen at the dinner table or out in a restaurant praying. They weren't ashamed to put their hand over their heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Honey, we were not ashamed. The, the Bible said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. The revival is the fire burning again. Let me tell you something I learned years ago. Boy, you don't have to be real smart, but some people never figured this out. Listen to me. You cannot hatch off baby chicks in a refrigerator. Those eggs have got to have some warmth. They got to have some heat. And it hatches off new life. You know, it's one thing. To, uh, thank God we live in the south. But boy, up north where it snows chest deep. Uh, you know, it's one thing to find us a, a traveler stranded in the snow, but just the fact that you found him, it's not enough. You got to get them back by some fire. Amen. Amen. To save them. Well, let me tell you, it's one thing to find somebody out in this old cold world, but when they bring them into a church that's just as cold as where they came from, you're not doing them a bit of good. Say amen. Honey, you got to have the fire of God rest upon a church. Let me prove something to you. On whatever street or road you live on, you let an old cold, refrigerated tractor trailer truck go down your road hauling a load of baloney. <laughs> Nobody gets excited about that. Nobody pays it any attention. But, buddy, you let a fire truck come down the road you live on. People go running out trying to see what's going on down there because that fire truck means something. It means there's some fire. You want to get the lost world, want to pay attention to what's going on, let the fire of God burn in the house of God. And listen, they'll be running out the door looking down the road saying what in the world's going on down there. And we just might, we just might have a little tiny part in bringing revival to this land of ours and see him exalted as king of kings and lord of lords. Hey, revival does not come from the government. Revival doesn't come from Hollywood. Revival doesn't come from the elites. Revival comes from an individual church that believes the book and doesn't mind taking their stand. Don't be some passive sissy. Grow a backbone if I got a choice between what's righteous and godly and what's unrighteous and filthy, I'm going to go for what's righteous every time, and every child of God needs to do that. That's biblical. Somebody say something. Man, we need revival. America needs revival. 
Oh, the mission's not complete. We might have some people in place that are going to feel a lean a little more our way and believe things our way, but that's no, res uh, that's no substitute for revival. We still need revival. And if America doesn't deliver the goods, God may withdraw his hand of blessing even yet. Somebody say amen. But you know what? A lot of folks don't want revival. I'm just going to be honest with you. Some folks, they don't like revival. You know why? Because it wakes them up from their nap at church. They're sitting there on the pew asleep, and if their neighbor shouts, whoa, it'll wake them up. They don't like that. And did you know there is a mentality among this so-called, and I say it with emphasis, so-called intellectuals that any type of religion is for the weak-minded. And boy, if you're like us and you don't mind shouting and jumping around, lifting your hands and clapping and caring, man, they'll think you are a real hillbilly. That's all right. I mean, I, I, y'all might have heard me tell this before, but at a camp meeting, a preacher had preached on uh, the sin of following tradition instead of following God. Great message. And so the preacher, the pastor got up and said, how many of you glad then that you old time shouting Christians? And the place went wild, waving their hankies, hooping and hollering and jumping, all but one little woman sitting right on the front. She had her hands folded. She had that bless me if you dare look on her face. You know, kind of like what some of y'all got on y'all face. And the pastor said, ma'am, what are you? And I mean no disrespect to this denomination. She said, I am a Presbyterian. I think she said, dignified Presbyterian. He said, ma'am, let me ask you a question. We've just heard a great message on tradition. Why are you a Presbyterian, dignified Presbyterian? She said, my great-grandmother was, my mother was, my grandmother, so I am. And this is a little harsh, but the preacher said, Ma'am, if your great-grandmother had been a moron, and if your grandmother had been a moron, and if your mother had been a moron, now you tell me what you'd be. She said, Now I'd be one of those shouting Christians. <laughs> See, they think we're a bunch of lunatics, but let me tell you, when you can shout, hey, I have no problem with ball games. I like them. I have no problem with the race. I don't have But listen to me. If you can shout your goozle to let's roll at a ball game and the Savior that delivered you out of a devil's hell wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life, changed you for all of eternity, I'm going to make it possible for you to meet that mom and that daddy on the other side again one day before long and you can't get excited over God. Something's wrong. Somebody give me an amen. Get a little fire. Get a little zeal. Get excited and let it carry over when you leave the house of God on Monday and Tuesday. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Revival. Probably back in the early days of Oliver Green. And the early days, and I do mean early, not that I'm faulting him, but the early days of Billy Graham when he preached like a wild man. America saw some revival in the 50s and early 60s. We've not seen a national revival since. I'm hoping, I'm praying that we're about to have the best one yet. Didn't the Bible say, I'll bless those that bless Israel? I believe the reason God blessed America is so we can in turn bless Israel. Oh, if you wonder how Israel feels about all this, they called a special session of their Congress called Parliament and endorsed what happened here in America. I'm on Israel's side. I'm on God's side. Somebody say something. But we need now to capitalize on what God has given us an opportunity. 
We need to have revival. Somebody say amen. Boy, fire attracts people. I mean, people come see what's going on. Man, we need the fire of God. Mm-hmm. Y'all still here? Number one, what is revival? Number two, who needs revival? Look in verse four of our text. Turn us, O God, of our salvation. There is not a lost person in the world can call him God of our salvation. People that say that are people that are saved. Right? And he said, turn us, O God, of our salvation. I'm going to tell you who needs revival. Lost people don't really need revival. They need salvation. Now, they'll feel the effects of it because if the church really gets revived, we'll be going out leading people to Christ, but they need salvation. The church needs revival. The God of our salvation. Let me tell you, now I know we got a young preacher sitting right here and he does not fit in the category I'm about to mention. I read something recently in a Christian paper, magazine type thing, and it said of the young preachers under 30, 74% of them did not believe in the virgin birth. 74%. They base their theology on so-called science instead of faith. And one of them made the statement, well, that's impossible. But my Bible says, with God, all things are possible. 74%. And wait a minute. About 60% uh, believed that the resurrection was only spiritual and not physical. I want you to know when Jesus died, they put him in that tomb. That spirit did rise on the third day, but it was inside a body when it rose. He met with them. They saw him. They talked to him. He was in a body. I believe in a bodily resurrection and about 60%. And I'm going to say it or bust. So-called preachers. So-called preachers did not even believe in a bodily resurrection. Now, look, I've got children and grandchildren. Most of you have the same. What kind of life, is, if I say if time lasts, what's it going to be on down the road, even if they go to church, if the churches are infiltrated by people that don't even believe the Bible? And they'd be, uh, their, their agenda is a, a political correctness instead of biblical correctness. I don't get it. I don't understand. If you're not going to believe the Bible, shut up and quit preaching. Get out of the way. Let somebody that's got the goods get up and preach. Amen. And all across America, I think, I think we might see the tide turning a little bit already. Somebody give me an amen. You know, what? I'm going to tell you who needs revival. The church needs revival. Preachers need revival. Sunday school teachers need revival. Youth workers need revival. Deacons need revival. My, everybody in the house of God, we, we need revival. We're not as fired up and as charged up as we like to think we are. Am I right? Oh, but you know what we're doing? We're comparing ourselves to these people that don't believe anything. And we think we're all right. Brandon, would you come here, son? I'm serious. Come here. Well, I know old Otor. You stand over here on this side of me. Now, as long as I'm comparing myself to Brandon, I don't think I'm too short of a fella. Uh-oh. Earl, come here, brother. You know what the church is doing? 
We're comparing ourselves to this bunch of deadbeat churches that's not doing anything for God. We're sticking out our chest saying, oh, look at us. We're fine. But instead of looking at other churches and other people, we need to be looking to Almighty God, and you'll find out we come up way short. Thank you, fellas, for being an illustration. We see what revival is, and we see who needs revival. We do. You address it there in the Bible. Turn to us, O God, of our salvation. Is that what it says? Good night. I go preach in other churches. I don't go too much on Sunday, but I, I'll go through the week sometimes. Sometimes it's one or two services. I have done week-long meetings, but I'm going to tell you, all across America, I'm going to give you another reason. I believe we need revival. I've been in churches that have the signs of death all in it. What do you mean, Brother Sam? Let me tell you the first sign of death. First sign of death is when there's no breath. I'll tell the first responders. If you go up on a scene, somebody's had a wreck or they've passed out, first thing you do, check, see if they're breathing. If they're breathing, they're not dead. But if they don't have any breath, they're dead. Well, most churches don't have much of the breath of God on it. Am I right? Let me tell you something else, another sign of death. When there's nobody will say anything at church. You go up to any dead person, talk to them, they're not going to talk back to you. They, won't, they don't have a thing to say. So, and you know what I'm saying is true. When you go to a church and, Nobody says a word. I, I mean, I've been to some churches, they so cold. I, I thought the ushers had ice skates on. It was, Lord, how, you couldn't get an amen out of anybody if you threw $5 bills out for amen. What is wrong? When I read my Bible, it talks about all through it that God is worthy of our praise. So it's the church. It's the good people. It's the saved people. It's those that really need to get a hold of something. And Look, I'm not expecting some of these to, to fast and pray, but I do kind of expect some true born-again serious believers. I had people tell me this week, Brother Sam, I did something this week I've never done. I, some of them might told me, one told me, said, I've been saved over 30 years, but Brother Sam, I've never fasted. But I did this week. I fasted and prayed. If nothing else, it got people to be where they needed to be all along anyway. But if we'll keep fasting and praying for God to bring revival in the land, I still think it's doable and possible because with God all things are possible. Somebody say amen. Hmm. Well, we've already seen who needs revival, the church. We've seen what it is and who revival uh, or, or why we need revival. I've got sense enough to know if time lasts 50 years from now, I'm not going to be standing here and preaching. I know Moses made it to 120, but I don't know if I will. And unless you're some of these young people, 50 years from now, you won't be seated here. But if time lasts 50 years from today, I hope somebody's preaching a word from this pulpit, shucking the corn and throwing the cobs at them, giving them the truth as it is in God's word. Somebody told me. It won't happen if we don't get revival and pass it down. I want to show you what I fully believe, why, and let me check the, I still got a little bit of time. I'm going to show you why I think that most Christians and churches don't have revival. I'm going to quote a verse in its proper way, and then I'm going to go back and tell you the way most people look at it. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, which are called by my name, Christians, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, 
then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and, and heal their land. Is that a verse of scripture or not? I think we've done a lot of it right. But here's the thing. Here's the way that modern Christianity is probably doing. If my people call by his name, they've humbled themselves and they prayed. But they've not been seeking God's face. Let me tell you what we've been seeking. We've been seeking God's arm. The Bible says, Brother Travis, that the arm of the Lord is not shortened, meaning God can still reach down and give you blessings. We've been seeking God's arm. God, give me this. God, give me that. God, do this. God, do that. Lord, I want this. I want that. All that kind of praying is seeking God's arm. He refers. That's the scripture. He refers to it. But in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, to have your land healed and bring revival, he said, you don't seek his arm. You seek his face. In other words, when you see God for who he is and how little you are and how much we need him, that it's all about him. It's all about his righteousness. It's not about any politician, good or bad. It's all about him. The problem is most people are not seeing God's face. When they pray, God, give me this, God, give me that. You know, Isaiah in the Bible said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. How did he see him? High and lifted up. He said his train did fill the temple. When he spoke, the, 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 the uh, doors moved at the power of God. Man, when you see God in his power, you see in him in his might, you see him in his holiness, you see him anything other than a glorified granddaddy or a glorified Santa Claus. You see him for who he is. We won't be strutting up to God, look at me. We'll all be wanting to fall at his feet. If my people, that's us, call by my name, that's Christians, will humble themselves and pray. We've seen some of that. But if we'll seek his face, turn from the wicked ways, God said, I'll hear from heaven. I'll heal your land. The mission is not complete just because we've got some more favorable circumstances in America. Thank God for the favorable circumstances. That wicked, ungodly, far-left, crazy agenda, I'm so thankful it was rejected. But that's still not a substitute for revival. The mission's not complete. The mission has just now started. I wonder how many of you would say, I want to do my part to bring about revival. I'm not going to be passive and sit on the side. You know what? The, the, most, the biggest excuse for laziness is, I pray about it. I pray about it. Can I be honest with you? There's some things you don't have to pray about because God's already told you what to do. I had a friend one time. He was a friend. And I asked him, I said, Brother, I would really love for you to go on visitation with me. And, you know, we'll, I'll show you about how to present the gospel and lead somebody to Christ. Now, the Bible's already told you to do that. No question. You don't have to pray. And uh, his answer to me was, Well, I'll, I'll pray about it. That's the worst excuse for laziness. Get it done. When God already tells you to do something, 
You don't have to pray about whether. Now, you need, might need to pray God give you the strength and the power and the ability. But you don't pray about should you or should you not do something. If God's already said do it, that's an excuse for disobedience and you want to look spiritual. Don't worry about the parents. Just go get the job done. Let's bring America back to the feet of Jesus. Let's bring America back to revival. I hope I've seen the last little, I haven't seen it personally. I hope I've heard about the last little murdered baby. I hope I've seen the last of all that kind of stupid uh, garbage that's tried to ruin this country. The Bible said there'd come a day they'd call good evil and evil good. We've had that day recently. Saying it was repulsive that we did not want to kill babies. Well, what's, uh, what's repulsive about saving life? I think it's repulsive to cut their arms and their legs off, crack their skull and suck their brains out. That's repulsive. Somebody give me an amen. We got some favorable conditions. And now, let's get the job done. Our Father God, we do pray for revival in this land of ours. Lord, I'm just praying right now that we'll not just talk the talk, but we'll walk the walk. And we'll do what we can to try to see America under submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You've already spelled out what's right. You've already spelled out what was wrong. And Lord, many, many people finally took a stand for what was right. And I just pray now that we'll follow through and do the right thing going forward and bring revival to America. We ask it in Jesus' name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me. Glory to his name. Yes. Glory to his name. Glory to his name.
We hope you have enjoyed this week's broadcast of Gethsemane Baptist Temple, the voice of Calvary. We invite you to join us here each week. Or better yet, join us on Sunday at 6116 Highway 81 South in Star, South Carolina. For more information, visit us online at www.gbtemple.com. We look forward to seeing you in church Sunday.